welcome everyone. Thank you for taking part in this special virtual beer tasting. This is a first. I'm so glad that you've all turned out. I hope you have your beers at the ready. I'm Laurel Westendorf, part of the community relations team here at the Deschutes Public Library. Today's presentation is on beer styles with John Abernathy. John wrote Bend Beer, a history of brewing in Central Oregon. He's been blogging about craft beer since 2004 when he launched The Brew Site, a blog dedicated to all things beer and brewing. John's been drinking and homebrewing beer for far longer, and he judges homebrew competitions and has served as the president of the local Central Oregon Homebrewers Organization for three years. Thank you so much, John, for guiding us through this virtual tasting experience. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. It's going to be it's kind of fun. It's something we've never done before, really, like this. <clears throat> yeah. I've done I've done some uh, presentations and things in in person. Obviously, working with uh, Coho, the Homebrew Club, um, we've done things over the years. Uh, I actually probably should clarify: I'm not currently the president of Coho um, Central Oregon Homebrewers. I this is my first year. I, I'd step down. So, um, but it's a fantastic club. I'm going to do a quick plug, quick little plug for them. Um, if you ever would like interested in home brewing, the process of learning to brew beer at home. Um, uh, learn about styles, learn about beer tastings, want to ever get into kind of beer judging, or just come hang out with a great group of folks. We can't really do a whole lot of that right now because of the pandemic with COVID-19, but <clears throat> it's a, I mean, it's just a lot of fun. Um, one of the best experiences I think I've had with home brewing was definitely as a member and then as president and member of the club. So, and I do want to do a quick um, thank you also to the shoots. Uh, library for especially doing all this and reaching out and asking if I'd be interested in um, drinking beer on a Wednesday night, which darn, I guess, you know, that's what I'm going to have to do. So I've got a uh, presentation here. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Yeah, let's see if we can't make sure everyone can see this here. All right. <clears throat> so as Laura mentioned, it's uh, beer styles, uh, a special virtual beer tasting, um, kind of the uh, little bit of a generic name um, for something that uh, I'm not covering the entire gamut of beer styles for this, but I wanted to select uh, several, uh, I came up with four kind of styles that are both um, kind of popular today, um, as well as just really nice <clears throat> styles of beer to drink. Um, especially some of them are very good for summertime drinking right now. I know today got a little cooler, but we're going to get really nice and hot over the weekend again. Um, so if you were following along on the, the, um, uh, the website, you saw uh, the spoiler alert here. The general styles I selected were a hazy IPA, a sour ale, and that's kind of more specific to American style sour ales. Um, Pilsner, sorry, I had to think for a minute. Pilsner and it's kind of craft lager in general. And then Porter. Porter is kind of a, one of my favorite styles, a nice classic throwback, but <clears throat> a lot of uh, fun is being had with it these days with a variety of um, flavors and, you know, additions and, you know, things being added to it in that regard. So let's get to our next here. Get in there and go. Who am I? Um, and Laurel touched on it a little bit. I've been blogging uh, about beer since 2004. Um, I've been writing about beer as well. I do a column with the Bulletin. Um, I wrote Bend Beer, the uh, history of brewing in Central Oregon that came out in 2014. Um, obviously, I'm a home brewer. I'm a beer drinker. Um, I've been home brewing beer since the mid-90s. <clears throat> the picture here on the bottom is kind of my, um, my setup. Very simple setup, but uh, a fun one. And I, um, I'm, I'm able to have a lot of fun with that and brew some, I think, tasty beers. Uh, I will go out on a limb and also say I've brewed some very non -so, not so tasty beers. It kind of happens to the best of us, but that's how we learn. So let's go right on into it. Um, hazy IPA. Before we get too far into it, I kind of wanted to touch on the kind of the background of IPA. What is India Pale Ale to sort of understand how hazy came around? Um, currently, top selling uh, style segment of craft beer is IPA. <clears throat> that actually kind of touches on the varieties I have listed below. But uh, right now within the craft beer world, IPA is kind of the, is the king. I mean, this is one of the popular beer, um, the, the popular styles that everyone is looking for with hops and flavor. 
And uh, Americans have really kind of capitalized that. So you can't go to a brewery anywhere anymore and not find some variant of a hopped beer or, or an IPA of some kind, it seems like. <clears throat> the style originated 17th century England. Um, it was a highly hopped, strong pale ale, very similar to one uh, known as Burton Ale that was brewed at the time. Um, despite a lot of the popular mythology, it wasn't exclusively brewed to be shipped to India. Um, the story goes that India Pale Ale, it was brewed to be stronger with more hops to preserve the beer on the three month voyage by ship to India. Um, in fact, the India Pale Ale name uh, didn't actually appear even until the 1830s. And England uh, and other countries were shipping beer all over the world at the time, not just India Pale Ale. Uh, I suspect in India Pale Ale as a name was probably a marketing term um, just because it was well known as the, the beer of India, along with Porter and many others. Today, there are just many variants. West Coast IPA is kind of the, <clears throat> excuse me, kind of the classic style with, kind of developed here on the West Coast in the craft, uh, craft beer world. It's very hoppy, very more bitter forward with piney and resiny flavors. There are black IPAs or Cascadian dark ales, which are brutal kind of like stouts, um, but they taste hoppy. You have Belgian IPAs, red IPAs, white IPAs, double imperial IPAs, and more. Of course, more being hazy IPA, also known as New England style. Um, this is kind of an interesting uh, 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 beer that it's, it got its start generally uh, with the Alchemist Brewery in Vermont, uh, often widely considered to be Hetty Toppers is, is the beer's name. I got a picture of it there. I just really kind of like that can. Um, uh, often can, you know, considered to be the first actual hazy IPA style. Um, Blew Up is super popular and the popularity of, hazy, of Hetty Topper inspired other New England breweries like Trillium, Treehouse, and many, many others. Um, to kind of start brewing this style. Um, unlike a lot of, you know, clear, filtered, you know, clean looking beers, the appearance of, the, of hazies generally is just hazy, cloudy. It can be opaque. It can even kind of appear muddy or like fruit juice. Um, it is very much um, kind of a, a, a style of focus on the hops, aromatics, and flavors. So especially with modern hop varieties coming out of uh, American uh, and New Zealand um, hop programs. Um, there's a lot of uh, focus on tropical fruits, um, fruitiness, fruit juices, and the way they make these kind of beers is by just uh, loading a ton of hops at the end of the boil and into the whirlpool and what they call dry hopping. <clears throat> That's where the hops go in Basically, after the beer has been fermenting and it's sort of uh, conditioning, they add more hops. And kind of a hallmark of the style is so much this hazy character from so many hops going into this, uh, going into these beers that it kind of develops these. Um, this is poly polypropyphenols, polyph polyphenols. Uh, I didn't bone up on my scientific terminology. Sorry about that. Um, which contribute this hazy, just opaque cloudy appearance. A lot of times beers, these beers are also brewed with uh, high protein grains such as uh, wheat, flaked wheat, um, oats, flaked oats, malted wheats, um, other things besides barley. Those, if you think about in terms of a Hefeweizen, classic like a Widmer Hefeweizen, that's um, one of those ones where that, that appearance is very hazy and cloudy and that's a large part due to the wheat character. So, I don't know what uh, beers everyone might have picked for this to go taste, but I picked um, Sun River Brewings, their Hawaiian Haze. It's a hazy IPA that's brewed with fruit. Uh, fruit is a very common addition to these types of beers as well. And Sun River Brewing here in uh, Central Oregon, they make some of the just the best hazies, the hazy styles uh, among the breweries here. And that's not to say there's not many others that are just fantastic. The Shoots Brewery does a great job with their fresh haze. Boss Rambler Beer Club does a great job with their um, double and triple dry hopped hazies. Um, Crux has some nice ones. Ten Barrel's got a hazy. Uh, Wild Ride, Worthy, you know, all the, all the big guys. Um, Good Life has Sippy Cup Hazy Pale Ale even. So <clears throat> this is a great style. It's basically 
uh, brewed like just like I said, barley, malted wheat, and flaked oats. It's incorporating, these are all kind of new world hops, Galaxy, Citra, Mandarina, Bavaria, Lotus. They're all going to contribute just very bright, very tropical flavors. And then Sun River had fun with it, added passion fruit, tangerine, and guava. So fruit forward, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to stop sharing for a moment so I can share the actual beer and show you what it's going to look like. So I got hey, the camera. Yes. John, we, we had a question about if people should commence tasting their IPA. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm about to crack mine open. There we go. And pour it. So pour along, start tasting. And at any time, you don't have to wait for me to start tasting beer. I'm I'm never gonna hold anyone up from actually wanting to taste. So <laughs> feel free to go right forward and go for it. So John, we had we have one more question. If yeah, I was, you. What you got? Uh, it was someone asked, when was the first beer made in history that we know of? Uh, that I could not tell you, and I'm not sure anyone else could tell you exactly. Um, the first beer in history, um, it was specifically, we don't know, uh, but there are beer, there's a beer recipe extending back to ancient Samaria with the uh, uh, hymn of Ninkasi. Ninkasi was the basically the Babylonian goddess of grain and fermentation and beer and uh, they've discovered there is a ancient recipe for beer on Sumerian clay tablets that um, describe the process of that beer in the hymn to Ninkasi. So when it was exactly brewed we don't know almost certainly there was probably other malted beer like for, uh, fermented beverages being made bef before and around and concurrently with that time but um, Sumerian Sumerian uh, beer would be the oldest that we probably have any kind of a real written record for, like verified written, so. And, oh, I see someone in chat. Leslie says, don't forget Bevel for Hazies. Yes, Bevel Craft Brewing here in uh, Bend also. They're relatively new, just celebrated their one year recently. Um, they are very uh, hot forward brewery and do some great job with Hazies as well. So here, a little shot of this beer here. You can just see with Sun River's um, hazy here, the Hawaiian haze, totally opaque, can't see me through it. It's nice, kind of a orange, almost a juicy color, um, kind of they're going for that, almost that pog kind of flavor. And it smells like, smells like pog, smells like juice. It's definitely a um, very bright, very pungent. It's one of those ones that um, just like it, it's going to come forward and it's going to get you in the, get your nose right before you even get, you know, get too close to your face or what, even as you're pouring. Notice there's a really nice white head of foams, very lacy, and that's what you call good, good legs with that, or in, with that, uh, the way it sticks to the side of the glass and not, you know, that head persists. So that's kind of really what you like, really like to see on a, on a beer. Um, I know there's some people that, you know, some places you can go to, they'll fill it right up to the rim and you don't barely get any foam, but you really do kind of want some of that. The foam is kind of the, the carbonation escaping a little bit, brings those aromatics to your nose and also is just kind of a, giving that really bright, you know, fun appearance. So taste along if you have some beers, I hope everyone does. I think Laurel and I were actually talking about um, this a little bit beforehand, and I don't expect everyone to necessarily have all four beers or four, but you're more than welcome to. I realize I have four beers I might need to finish tonight, so we'll see how that goes. Definitely we'll be tasting all of them. And we had another question about what is your favorite style of beer and why? I just saw that pop up too. Um, that's a very good question and a very hard question because um, it's kind of like saying who's your you know what's your favorite child or what's your who's your favorite uh, parent um i am very much a fan of many beer styles i try to always try um multiple styles and it's something new um ones that i really actually quite like um besides i mentioned porter earlier i just have a fondness for porter um barley wines are terrific when they're brewed you know very well uh, those are very strong dessert, uh, like cold weather beers or maybe kind of nightcap sippers. Um, <clears throat> I do love a really, really well-made IPA. Um, 
And sometimes that's going to be hazy, just like this. Sometimes it's going to be kind of a West Coast style. There's some fantastic, uh, what they call the white IPAs, which uh, Deschutes Brewery just re-released a classic of theirs called Chainbreaker. And that's basically, a, it's kind of an IPA, but it's brewed more like a Belgian white style. So it's very wheat forward and a little yeasty, but it's got the kind of those, um, still that American level of uh, hopping to it. And it really works really well. So, but that's a tough question. Um, Fred Eckhart was a beer writer based out of Portland and uh, he coined it, well, coined it. He said, uh, when it asked like, what's your favorite beers? His question, his answer was always the one in my hand or in my glass. And when someone asked him what his next favorite beer was, it'd be, the second favorite would be the next beer I'm gonna drink. So I like to give that as an answer. The beer in my glass is my favorite. So if anyone has any particular questions about any hazies or anything along the way, like you know, keep keep shooting them this way. Um, I'm really kind of enjoying this. It's just a nice, it's got a little bit of hot bitterness. It's got a lot of fruit character from the fruits coming through. I'm getting um, some of that herbal uh, floral character from those hops as well. And it's just kind of a, it's really just kind of lovely. A lot of these hops, citrus is in particular, and I believe galaxies tend to give kind of a very citrus, <laughs> citra and citrus, uh, and uh, so a lot of pineapple and um, kind of mango kind of characteristics. Some of the, uh, some of the others, I'm not sure, the new one, uh, the newest one on that list, I believe was Lotus. And that's kind of tends to be a lot, a little more floral and jasmine like, I think. Um, so this, this is really doing very well. I just like Sun River just does a great job and nails it, kind of knocks it out of the park every time. So I really highly recommend it. But, and if anyone's got any particular beers they're drinking and liking tonight, I see the poll on the screen, which is cool. Um, let me know what you're drinking too, you know, pop them in the chat or uh, onto the questions. I don't know that you guys in the audience can see the polls, but it was hazy IPA was yep. easily the most exciting for everyone at 42%. And it was pretty much split three ways between the sour Pilsner and stout. Yeah. These are kind of a wide variety of styles too. So <clears throat> I don't necessarily expect everyone to like everything. You know, someone who's going to really like a Pilsner may not like sours or vice versa. So, all right. So that's, this is just a terrific example of a hazy. Like I said, Sun River does a great job. Bevel does a great job. Um, like Boss Rambler, Deschutes, Worthy, Crux, Good Life. Everyone, I mean, there's, there's a lot of ones. And I see, yes, in chat, we have a Three Creek Subtle Haze IPA. That's terrific beer. That's, that's actually one of my favorite new beers from Three Creeks this year. Uh, Monkless and Ale Apothe Apothecary Collaboration Triple. Very nice, although not really to the style we're talking about. I like it. Skook and Gene Pool Ancestral Double IPA. I'm going for the strong stuff. I like it. Good job, Mary. And then uh, someone's got the Virtual Beer Hub from Deschutes Brewery. That's another good one that they uh, had a limited uh, release on. So, oh, and I see a Freem Hazy. Excellent. You guys are just knocking it out. Okay, let's go back to sharing here. Let's jump to the next style. I'm gonna take one more sip. And I'll come back to that later. So, move on here and let's go to sour ales, American style sour ales are kind of what I'm focusing on. But kind of like IPAs, I'm gonna give a little, you know, we'll do a little bit of background on this. Um, kind of sour ales before pasteurization, um, you know, before modern era, all beer would eventually sour. Um, beer was stored in wooden casks. Um, casks, I have a little point down below, often um, hold wild organisms, wild yeasts and bacteria, which will contribute souring characters. You'll hear names like Britannomyces and Pediococcus, uh, Lactobacillus. These are all organisms that can eventually sour these beers. So a lot of beers, including old style IPAs, you know, very old, you know, porters and things would eventually end up turning sour. Probably in large part why IPA got as popular as it did. Not everyone wanted sour beers and the higher hop levels and the higher strength would kind of help buffer that a bit. Um, 
many Belgian styles today. Uh, you'll see Lambics, Goose, Flanders Red, Oud Bruins. These are all beers that embrace that sour character. So a lot of countries like Germany with some, some exceptions, um, England, uh, France, you know, uh, the Netherlands, you know, well, the Netherlands have some wild ones too. They all moved away from, you know, wanting, you know, sour or spoiled beer. So um, they developed, you know, techniques. When pasteurization was developed, they moved into that. So trying to do everything they can to keep beer as fresh and not sour as possible. The Belgians, however, went all in. Um, these are not only sour, some of these are spontaneously fermented. Some of these are wild or mixed culture beers. Kind of goes into my different ways to sour a beer. Um, extended barrel aging with active cultures in the wood, very common, very common with um, some, some of the Lambic and uh, the Flanders red styles, and kind of in conjunction with spontaneous fermentation or pitching wild yeasts intentionally in culture, bacterial cultures. Um, Lactobacillus is a very common uh, souring bacteria it's used in yogurt and other fermentation. Um, Lactobacillus can be used, you, know, you might have to start with sour mash, which anyone who knows about sour mash whiskeys and, and the such, it's a similar type of thing. Um, or you might pitch a culture, uh, an actual you know, lactobacillus culture, and sometimes that could even be yogurt, into your beer to develop kettle souring. So sour ale, this whole kettle souring technique is kind of a hallmark of this um, American style sour ales, not really the wild ales as much. Kettle souring's got a more of a controlled process that the brewers are trying to manage that acid level a little bit better and you know, the drinkability level. Um, you, even given that, you can find some beers that are just barely tart to some that are almost paint strippingly sour. Um, and some, you know, just depends on the flavor profile you're looking for, those might be appropriate. But it's called kettle souring because typically brewers will prepare the wort, which is essentially the pre-boiled beer that before it gets pitched with yeast. So they mash the grains, collect off uh, the, the liquid is kind of a, it's basically syrup. I mean, for that all intents purposes, it's kind of that uh, grain, grain soup. Um, they inoculate it with the lactobacillus culture intentionally and let it sit typically overnight, but it could go longer um, until it gets to kind of pre-sours that wort to its desired pH levels. So the wort's still full of sugars. It's still full of all the everything needed for yeast to go and ferment it. But once they get it down to, say, a 4.5 pH, which starts to be pretty sour and could be a little bit more, you know, lower, they'll heat it up, kind of basically pasteurize it to kill off the lactobacillus pitch regular yeast <clears throat> and whatever variety they're using as normal to basically finish fermenting that beer. These are going to be typically fairly low ABV alcohol style, alcohol by volume um, styles of beer just because uh, lactobacillus and some of these delicate uh, characteristics you want from the sour, you don't want to overdo it. Um, oftentimes you're going to see in the range of, well, it could even be three and a half to five and a half percent maybe on the uh, upper end. There's always going to be, you know, you always find some exceptions, but a lot of them I see are typically around four to five percent. Common styles that often employ this method, especially among American craft brewers, um, Berliner Weiss, which is a classic German uh, sour wheat style. Um, Goza is also a German style. It's a soured wheat, um, and it's interestingly enough, spiced with uh, coriander and salt, typically sea salt. Very um, niche, obscure style that basically died off in all but one town in Germany until uh, in recent years, American craft brewers have kind of rediscovered it and started re you know, brewing their own interpretations of it. And then oftentimes you'll just see American style sour ale or American sours, um, uh, very commonly incorporating fruit and um, other types of adjuncts. I mean, it's very common to see flavored sours. Uh, there's a brewery in Portland named Great Notion Brewing and they have kind of perfected this um, is, I don't know if you call them a pastry sour or dessert sour, but it's a similar method, but they have one called blueberry muffin. Um, and it's a sour ale with blueberries and the types of grains they use, it, it smells exactly like a fresh baked blueberry muffin. You get that good blueberry character in there. Um, it's really, it's a kind of over the top. Uh, it's not one, not one you'd want to drink a lot of because it's almost like a dessert beer or a breakfast beer, but great example. Um, I named some examples here locally uh, what we have. And I think the number one I picked was 
Ching Ching from Ben Brewing Company. So this is a fun beer. It's one of the um, oldest locally brewed sour ales. It was invented, uh, well, invented first brewed uh, around 2011 when it first won a uh, GABF medal. It got a, it's got a couple of medals at the Great American Beer Festival. Um, for those that know, uh, Tanya Cornette was the brewmaster at uh, Ben Brewing Company at the time, and she developed this recipe and kind of this sour program. Um, way ahead of everyone else in the region at the time for doing um, sours. And it incorporates uh, pomegranate and hibiscus. So it's some fruits, but a very kind of different character fruit. Four and a half percent, five IBUs. Those are those international bittering units from hops. Very, very low in these styles of beers. because They're basically just there to help kind of give that preservative uh, character you know, to the beer not to give any real hop character or, or you know, overwhelm it with any bitterness or anything. So I'm gonna go ahead and switch, stop sharing and come back to the screen. I've got the can of Ching Ching. Tanya has since left, had since left um, Ben Brewing for Ten Barrel Brewing where she's developed the crush line of sours that they have as well as um, Swill, they're kind of their summer sh shandy uh, and a bunch uh, many other the sour sour beers there they're fantastic sours. Incredibly talented brewer. I'm happy that Ben Brewing is able to kind of continue on with uh, their you know their program with Ching Ching. They've developed other ones. Uh, Raz Tafari is another one which is raspberry. Um, they have, oh, I can't remember, there's one uh, and I'm totally blanking on it, but there's several others um, along, you know, those lines. Terrific beers. Pop this guy, and this is a really fun, pretty beer too. You'll see, is it? If you haven't seen it before, especially the pomegranate and the hibiscus, just give this a beautiful pink um, body, kind of a purple pink body. It's even got a little bit. It's kind of hard to tell on the camera, but the foam itself is even kind of pink. And it's just, I mean, it's just a beautiful beer. When you have sunlight, hold it up to sunlight. Don't do it for long. You don't want it to spoil the beer, but it just, it just looks amazing. It's kind of like a ruby. It's very jewel, uh, jewelly, jeweled color and appearance to it. You'll see this doesn't have, and most sours I find don't have as fluffy or as big a head of foam as the IPA, for instance. Ah, peach offering. I see that in chat. Yes, BBC. Ben Brewing also a peach offering, I like it. Thank you, Leslie. Um, I find that sours, I, I, I suspect it's the acid levels, but the, the acidity of it tends to kind of reduce that head retention. There's, there also tend to be lower um, amounts of protein, which is kind of what builds that foam um, in these types of beers, probably similar because of the acid and similar issues just with, uh, it's basically a lower ABV beer. Um, and you know maybe the lacto affects that but it smells terrific. You get a little bit of that tartness. And honestly, it, this can be off-putting to some people, but I really like it. If you think of yogurt, um, like Nancy's or, you know, very um, natural yogurt, you kind of get that tart, tangy aroma. There's a hint of that in here, which is just really nice. It kind of, for me, it gives me, um, almost makes it like mouthwatering and very appealing. You get, get the berry, kind of that pomegranate berry character that's not, you know, it's, it's bright, it's not overwhelming. Um, there's just a nice little floral character coming off the, some of the hibiscus as well. And it's just all around a really nice aroma. I mean, when, they, when they're done like this and done really well, like I said, it's almost, almost um, their culinary component because it's, for me, it's like what I like to call appetizing. So I don't know if uh, anyone else have a sour beer. I see in the chat, uh, Laurel asked. Anyone else pick a sour to go along with tonight or is that not everyone's jam? So I'd be kind of curious. I'm gonna take a sip while I wait for some answers. Nope, someone says not our jam. I like it. Well, this is kind of jammy actually. It's really, it's got that tart character but it's not at all overwhelming. I talked about running the gamut between just barely sour and paint stripping. This is like solidly right in the middle and really just well balanced. So you get, it gets tart. You feel it on the sides of your tongue and the back of the kind of the back of the jowl area and kind of get there. 
but you also get this fruity jammy kind of character really mid palette that's really nice with that fruit um, it's really bright which is good i mean it's kind of what you you want to see something like that when you have a fruited sour you don't want to have those muddled um, kind of characters but it's really really, really bright well defined mm. a little hint of sweetness almost reminds me of a um, kind of a raspberry syrup uh, and let's see we got the chat we have uh raspberry one uh laurel says she really loves raspberry crush from ten barrel yep karina peach sour from ecliptic ecliptic's peach sour is another great example of a really nice kettle soured beer they've done a great job with that one and peaches are, are not something you see terribly often with beer just because they're very seasonal and they're they can be hard to brew with because they're very um very light and they can lose a lot of character so this this they ecliptic's done a great job with those I see a Bangarang Prickly Pear Sour from Silver Moon. That was pretty good. And uh, some non-fans, totally fine. Not at all gonna criti <laughs> criticize anyone for not liking sours. It's, it can be a very acquired taste. Um, so some people love them, some people hate them. Um, every now and again, you find one that's just like perfect and you know maybe nothing else does it for you. But. Hey John, is there a good beginner sour beer for people who want to just try them out? Honestly, um, Ching Ching is a pretty good beginner sour because it's not terribly strong. I mean, it's, it's got that really well-rounded balance to it. It's nice, nice acidity level, but even if it might be a little, little bit much, it's hard to say. Uh, Ten Barrels Crush series um, with the, the fruited additions they do on those, I find those to be pretty approachable and really those could be uh you can kind of consider them some nice beginner level <laughs> beginner level i hate to say it like that because it not to be demeaning um but you know good good uh, entry level sours honestly the the karina peach sour from ecliptic is a good one deschutes does a number of sours um uh, they'll rotate through um, i do find some of their sours to be um more complex they've got uh, they've done a few where i mean just some very interesting fruits and spices um that they might be you know especially if you're a little more in the culinary side of things maybe those are something to try if you're not wanting to just you know um go for the kind of the straight sour so hopefully uh, it gives you some pointers if anyone's curious I see Leslie uh, actually I pulled up the Q and A here. Just going along with her. She says she says she wished they would call them tart instead of the turn off sour. The term sour. Yeah, I can see that. Um, sour has kind of become the ingrained descriptor. That it seems like um, tart is a good term for it. Although sometimes with tart, I tend to think of more uh, sour fruit. So, and not all of them are very are like that. Some. If you start looking beyond these kettle sour uh, lacto varieties and start looking at things sour to the uh, Brettanomyces that are typically soured and that's a wild yeast that continues that process. Um, some that are have <clears throat> pedio or even even some that have an acetic acid, which is kind of a vinegary kind of character. Not bad thing, but they go off in different directions. And I wouldn't call those tart per se, but I would call them sour in certain circumstances. Not every Brettanomyces beer is going to be sour in that sense. So, all right, I'm going to have another sip and then let's move on to the next style. I'm going to pour a little bit more. So hopefully um, for the non-fans uh, in the chat, maybe try pick one up again some point and see how it goes. It'd be kind of fun. If not, that's okay. We're not going to hold you to it. All right, let's switch out here a little bit. Bring my screen back up. So our next style that I'm going to talk about, Pilsner. This is a fun one. This is kind of one I picked more, um, not because it's necessarily it's a big flashy um, marketing well, I don't say marketing, but it's not one like hazy IPAs or sours tend to be real are hot right now. They're very flashy. They're very uh, kind of out there for big, bold flavors and, you know, sours and fruits and all those kind of hops and everything. 
Pilsner is a great one though, because there's been a resurgence of kind of craft Pilsners and lagers with uh, craft, craft brewing in the last number of years after a lot of uh, craft breweries early, in the, early on in the era moved away from them, partially because of the stigma related to uh, macro brewed industrial Pilsners. Oh, I have an extra point that I didn't clear out. That's okay. I'll make something up. Pilsner and other lager. Um, lager was kind of fast becoming the world's most popular style or category of beer beginning in the 19th century. Um, it really uh, kind of exploded with Louis Pasteur discovering uh, that yeast was responsible for ferment fermentation of beer, you know, discovered as a microorganism. His name is what, you know, they derived pasteurization from. Um, it kind of brought more of the brewing and yeast uh, kind of techniques um, you know, knowledge to the brewing world, um, in which case lager as opposed to ale is a type of uh, the yeast ferments from the bottom of the bottom of the fermenter. So that's my missing point there, I guess we'll, we'll call it that before we get into too much. Ale yeast tends to rise to the top of the beer as it's fermenting. So when you see a fermenting beer at a brewery, typically if you see that, if you ever get a chance to see in the tanks, you'll see a big rocky layer of foam and, and uh, you, know, you know, particulates and everything. That's that yeast rising to the surface and, and doing its work. Um, it works better in warmer temperature, uh, warmer temperatures typically, and it gives off more fruity, estery kind of characterful flavors. Lager yeast, on the other hand, um, ferments cooler temperatures and it tends to ferment from the bottom of the, of the fermenter. So you don't have that rising up and, and going um, kind of all rocky headed. There will be some of that, but um, that's kind of the hallmark of a lager yeast is that cooler fermentation temperature um, and that ferments from the bottom. Because it's cooler, it takes typically longer to ferment out. So lagers uh, would take anywhere from two, three, four to eight weeks to fully brew. Whereas ales, you can brew in two weeks. So uh, for a long time, um, before the lager yeast and everything was discovered, ale was all it was. By the 18th, 19th century, excuse me, lager um, came out, it was the longer aging times, the smoother character and the mellower character from the yeasts. Um, just made that a very popular drinkable style that more and more people were gravitating to. In 1842, Pilsner Urquell was brewed, basically invented for the first time um, in Pilsen, was now the Czech Republic by Joseph Grohl, who's a brew, brewmaster from Bavaria. Um, it, it was just a clear golden lager, the very first of its kind, frankly. Um, becoming a sensation, I mean, and much, much copied. It was copied by breweries all around the world because uh, the fact that you could see through the beer, you could see this beautiful golden crystal clear beer. Glassware was developed just to showcase um, uh, th this beer. Um, it was just kind of a fabulous beer. I mean, it became the world standard as far as it goes uh, for basically all beer. So you have German brewers come into America and bring in lager brewing there. Anheuser-Busch in the 1800, 1880s, excuse me, um, in an attempt to copy or brew their own version of a Pilsner invented Budweiser. And at the time, Budweiser, you look at it today and it's like, oh yeah, well, sure, it's the cheap beer, et cetera, et cetera. But the Budweiser of the late 19th century was um, a very well-brewed beer. They actually had to incorporate, figure out how to incorporate rice into the brewing process because American grains were too coarse and not, you know, not light enough for act the proper Pilsner character. So brewing Budweiser was a premium expensive um, undertaking and Budweiser, you know, it became known as the king of beers for a number of reasons, but not the least of which because it was a premium, truly premium beer. Over the years, Pilsners um, and lagers and everything became subject to industrialization, consolidation, um, mass market appeal, prohibition effectively killed the brewing beer industry in the United States for 13 or more years, depending on you know, what state you were in. Um, so kind of all these things and the growing, uh, these growing Bud Miller Coors, the BMC lagers and companies kind of took over as far as those were the beers that kind of um, 
logically kind of came out of that. So by the 1970s, 1980s, there were only a handful of actual brewery brewing companies. And uh, most beers were these um, very light, light lagers, these light um, kind of American Pilsners at the time didn't really bear much resemblance to the lagers and Pilsners of the 19th and early 20th centuries. For a long time, American craft brewers kind of avoided making lagers and Pilsners, partially because they wanted to differentiate themselves from the Bud Miller Coors companies, partially because brewing lagers is hard. I mean, it, it takes up extra tank space for longer amounts of time. And when, when you're a small brewer who has two ferment, fermentation tanks and um, one of those has to sit for six to eight weeks with beer, you can't, can't brew more beer with it. Um, that's, that's just cost prohibitive. So for a long time, there were a lot of um, breweries that just, if they brewed a lager, it was rare, um, or they just avoided them altogether. The last 20 years or so, you know, 20 years since, you know, early 2000s, uh, we've seen a real resurgence as kind of the craft brewers have kind of rediscovered this classic styles, these, these um, old world styles, and putting their own spins on it. And a lot of uh, pilsners and lagers are just coming out terrifically, like, um, running the range from traditional classic to hop forward styles employing, you know, there's a lot of these new world hops with their own spins on it. Um, similar styles you'll see uh, that they'll, they'll be labeled as, and these are all similar. They're not exactly the same. I know there's, um, especially when you're judging beer and oftentimes when you're, you know, when you're brewing it and things, there's, there's a definite, definite differentiation here, but with there's Bohemian or Czech pills, um, German pills tend to be drier, more uh, a little lighter bodied and hoppier. Um, Helles Lager is actually another German style of lager. It's from Munich and it's very similar to kind of a German pills and these others. Um, for kind of for all these purposes, I'm kind of lumping these all into a similar bucket with Pilsner. Um, India Pale Lager was almost kind of a marketing term for uh, American brewers who were kind of creating some of these hop forward, um, hoppy, uh, beers that were lagers. Uh, and then sometimes, and I saw someone put this in the uh, chat and this kind of what I recommended also, sometimes you'll find Vienna lager or, and or Mexican style lager kind of lumped into these. Tres Arroyos Mexican lager from Three Creeks Brewing and Sisters is a great example of that. They call it a Mexican style lager, but it's really brewed with uh, Pilsner malt and some corn. So it, to my taste, it's really much more of a Pilsner than what you'd find a, or, you know, as a Mexican style lager, which is kind of based on Vienna, which itself is a kind of an Austrian style. It was a little bit darker, but does not have a um, lot of examples out there that are, you know, kind of in the modern world. So you'll see some of those. Let's go on in. I know the one of the first uh, beers I recommended on the list was Crux Pills. But when I was at the store and I was um, looking for uh, beers to grab, I found Heater Allen Pills and I couldn't resist. Heater Allen Brewing Company is based in McMinnville. They're actually one of the, among the first of the Oregon craft breweries to really specialize and almost exclusively brew lagers. I believe they were founded in 2008. Um, and at the time, it, I mean, that's a tough road to hoe. It was a for a small brewery in a small town like McMinnville, and they're close to Portland, but it was, you know, brewing all lagers was notable and it was tough, but they've, they were, um, nailed the styles. This, um, Peter Allen pills, the pill, their pills is inspired by Pilsner Kell. So it's kind of based on that Bohemian or Czech pale lager. Um, it's going to find be maltier and fuller bodied than a typical German pills. A lot of craft Pilsners are based on the German pill style. So this will be a, this is a fun one to drink. Um, 5% ABV, 38 IBUs, so hoppy, but not terribly hoppy. Go ahead and quit sharing for the moment so I can open up and pour, pour for everybody to see. And I'm actually nerdy enough that I've got a, I guess it's authentic, a Pilsner Urkel um, mug. So an actual mug that, uh, you know, the official Pilsner Urkel uh, Stein. So I figured that was perfectly perfect for the Czech inspired you know, lager here. Let's go ahead and pour this guy. One of the first things you should notice about a really nice, give it up in the camera view there, 
Pilsner or lager like this is just the clarity of it. Now it's kind of hard to tell with, um, uh, with the camera. You can see the light shining through a little bit there. But in person, uh, I can see right, th right through that. This glassware makes everything look a little funky because it's got the dimples, it's cool. Um, but I, it's got a beautiful clarity, really nice golden color. Um, to me, uh, on the camera, it looks like it's coming through a little more orange than it, than it really is. Beautiful head of uh, foam again on the top. Nice little white, white pour of foam. It's kind of a little bit rocky, a little bit fine. Let's see if we can get in there a little bit. You see that lacing on the side of the glass again? Kind of exactly what you want to look for. Now see if we can get a good clarity there. So this is one that's going to be a little more hop forward, a um, little maltier. And it's just, yep. Yeah. But the other thing to know about these kind of beers is they're also very subtle and that's by design. So I've known, and it took me a long time to kind of start differentiating some of these more, but I, you know, I know a lot of people who, unless they're really big lager drinkers or they've been doing this a long time, it's hard to pick out any real, a lot of distinguishing flavors here, but like I'm, so the aroma for this on me is some nice graininess. I'm getting some of those, some of those subtle um, hops. So this is going to be some, what they call noble hops or kind of a classic European variety. This, you know, Saz is the one that's typically used with Pilsner or Cal, S-A-A-Z is how you spell it. And it's kind of got a spicy, um, old world, slightly floral character. And just some nice graininess. Just not a, it's almost like a little bit like a bread crust and a little bit like, um, I don't want to say granola, but if you go in that direction, you can kind of pick up some of that grain character. Um, granola itself is going to be way too sweet and other things going on. And let's see, I got to look at the chat here and someone does have uh, the Trace Arroyos, Mexican lager, very good one. Good Life Bavarian Lager, the Hella style. Yes, that's a great beer too. Deschutes from Deschutes, D-A-S-H-O-T-A-Z, from Deschutes is a very nice, um, very nice light pills or lager. They brewed that to be a little lower ABV and low cal. So it's like kind of a lifestyle. Five Fin by Pelican, and someone's got Czech style pills from Bowie Beer. Bowie Beer in Astoria makes another very good, very authentic Czech style. So let's go ahead and taste. Mm. So that's just, it's like a perfect kind of sessionable sip. I'm getting spicy hops, not too really too bitter or anything, but it's kind of a spicy, almost a kind of a black pepper kind of character to those hops. I'm getting a really nice, it's a light body, but it's a nice kind of a, again, kind of a bread crust kind of character coming out of those grains. Um, and it's just what you'd call Moorish. Um, you want to drink more. I mean, literally Moorish kind of refers to the, you know, food or drink where um, it's kind of a, that indescribable quality that makes you want to just keep sipping and keep, keep drinking. I love this type of style of beer for summertime. Hot weather, a really crisp, well-brewed Pilsner um, or Hellas Lager or a Mexican style lager. Um, just, it's a terrific, Terrific, just hot weather beer, cool, you know, nice and cool, it's bracing. It's kind of gives you some nice, um, just nice sessionable flavors. It's not too heavy. You can drink several of these as a, as a session and it just really works out well. So what does everyone think of their lagers? Since I, see, since I saw a lot of those roll through in chat, I hope everyone's enjoying them. Um, all the ones I see listed there are just really nice examples. I will do another shout out for Crux. Um, Crux is one of the breweries here in Bend that always at least tries to have three, sometimes four lagers on tap. They're not necessarily Pilsners. Crux Pils is a great beer, but they had a, um, a Hey Duke Helles, which was um, really also excellent German style, that Helles Munich lager. Um, they always, not always, but they have a really nice pre-prohibition style lager, which kind of harkens back to those American Pilsners before prohibition. So definitely more robust, uh, maltier, hoppier in a traditional sense style of beer. And every now and again, I see a real nice um, change of pace and they'll see something like um, a Schwartz beer, which is a black lager, classic German, similar to a porter, for instance, only in lager format. But 
I mean, these are just terrific. And oftentimes I go to um, breweries and one of the first things, if they've got a lager or two on tap, and I haven't been to a brewery in a while, unfortunately, but um, I will probably try that lager among one of the first things. My usual go-tos for trying, if especially if it's a new brewery I've never been to, there's try a lager if they have it and try their IPA. And if they've brewed, if they can brew a good IPA and a good lager, then those are tough styles to get well. So those are definitely um, good benchmarks I always find. Hey John, can you um, talk a little bit about what people mean when they say session? Yeah, so a session, there's multiple meanings. It's kind of a loaded word in the beer world, actually. Um, the session would be the, uh, when you sit down for a beer, you go to the pub, you go to, uh, you know, go to the beer bar, you go to the brewery. Um, you just want to sit down and sit down with friends and have a few beers, maybe grab a bite to eat. It's a session. It's a drinking session. It kind of comes from a little bit more of the English uh, pub style of culture where uh, they brew low ABV pub beers, often cask ales, cask uh, beers, what they call them, that might be three to 4% that are designed for drinking several, multiple over that session that you're at the pub. So session beer typically refers to, depending on who you ask, can, can, can refer to a beer that's under 4% alcohol, so light and easy drinking. It can refer to, and I use this a little more in this sense, like a session or sessionable beer. Um, any beer that may be five to five and a half percent, under under six percent, started to get a little loosey goosey there. But something that's easy drinking that I might, if I go to Crux, I might have two couple of pints of Pilsner. I mean, that's that would I could consider that to be a sessional beer, sessionable beer. And then you'll see it attached to some style designations. Going back to IPA, there is a um, there is a session IPA style or an India session ale is what it's called. It's essentially just an IPA that's brewed lower lower ABV, lower alcohol. Um, some people just refer to those as pale ales. Um, kind of accurate, not totally, because there's some that are very much more in the hopping and the dry hopping sense of things as a than a pale ale would be. So you're trying to aim, aim for that four and a half percent drinkability with Kind of IPA levels of hops. And frankly, it doesn't always work because more malt and hops kind of balance each other. When you have less malt, more hops can very easily take over. So, but as far as session goes, yeah, it just re kind of refers to that easy drinking, um, lighter, lower, lower ABV style. Uh, I'm not one of those ones that's going to say it has to be under 4% or under 4.5%, but I wouldn't call an 8% uh, beer sessionable. Even if it might taste like it, I would never call it that. All right. I'm talking and talking, so we probably better move on to our final beer. This is another fun style. This is where I was talking about with porters. Let me get back to my screen share. And porter, another classic style originating in uh, 18th century England. So we have a lot of English styles that have informed a kind of American craft brewing. Um, this is really the dominant style of beer drank in London during the 1700s, um, popular especially among the working classes and uh, among the working classes were the dockside porters down at the Thames River of, uh, <laughs> that runs through London, so basically lending their name porter to the beer. Um, this was really even before Pilsner and Lagers um, the first truly international style of beer. Um, it was exported all over the world. It, the popularity uh, during the 1800s just kind of, this was, became a sessionable beer. Everyone wanted to drink it. Um, it was just a fantastic uh, drinking beer, brewed a number of different ways. And there's a number of historical oddities around it that, and more myths kind of along the same, along the same lines as IPA that I'm not going to get too much into. But I will uh, speak to the fact that stout, stout beer styles, which is now a separate style today, began as life known as a stout porter or basically a stronger porter. Um, Guinness Brewery in Ireland, Ireland began by brewing stout porters that began slowly, slowly diverging more and more into the um, kind of roasted Irish stout style. And they, pretty soon they stopped calling it 
porter and it just became stout. So and Guinness was kind of one of the first ones that openly brew a stout as a stout. Um, kind of like a lot of beers, IPA and a lot of these other ones is the same, same story, but in porter in particular, really good decline in popularity after World War II. Um, the wars kind of killed, the world wars kind of killed a lot of the brewing industry in Europe. Um, and really porter, uh, the, the popularity just kind of fell off and almost um, almost was non-existent before the, being revived in the craft brewing era. Now it's not totally accurate because there were some American style porters. Those were typically kind of paler ales brewed with oftentimes caramel syrup to color them to make them look darker. But really before in America and, and even in some of England, uh, a lot of the classic porters were just kind of almost fell by the wayside. Um, one of the classic classic porters in America right now is Black Butte Porter. Um, that's my kind of my point about third one down, but uh, Deschutes, I'll say right now, introduced that in 1988. It was there when they opened. Um, and almost, uh, they didn't single-handedly revive the style, but they were a big part of it that early on. Um, they led with, as a flagship with Black Butte Porter, uh, and that really set them apart, and it was very well brewed. And that's what made, I think, a lot of craft brewers at the time realize that, you know, these are some styles that we can really do well. The importer became um, very popular, and still is very popular with the shoots. It's not their top seller anymore. Um, it's an IPA now these days, of course, but it was definitely one of the ones that, um, I mean, it's just a classic. And the shoots is Black Butte is often considered kind of the benchmark for an American style. Now, what you're looking for in a good porter is something that's gonna be dark, but not heavy like a stout. It's gonna have some roastiness, should have some chocolate character, some sweet caramel. You might get a little bit of coffee-ish notes. Um, it should never be heavy. It should never be really thick bodied or anything, um, unless you're looking at like a dessert or pastry porter, that's a different, whole different ball game. But American porters are typically gonna be stronger and more aggressively flavored, um, probably hoppier than their English counterparts. Americans, Americans like to make things stronger and go a little more excessive. So a lot of hops, more malt body, more, a little, little more strength, some more, you know, more character they want to get in there. Um, porter as a style is a great base for other flavors. Uh, you'll see a lot of these, um, vanilla, coffee, chocolate, um, and more. Um, and which is kind of why, in part, I went with a different beer than Deschutes. I was going to go with Deschutes Brewery, but then I saw this, and this is a fun one that I really like um, as well. Wild Ride Brewing, their Nut Crusher Peanut Butter Porter. Um, and it, this is a fun one that's uh, it's, it's, it's interesting because it's not only does it taste pretty much just like peanut butter, or have a really good peanut character in it, but it's actually allergen free. They don't use nuts in this beer. So it's an, it's an extract that doesn't have any of the actual nut allergens that they add post fermentation. So this is actually, if you have a peanut allergy or anyone who has any kind of nut allergies can drink this. So this is kind of more accessible as one of those types of things. Um, it began as a winter seasonal when uh, Wild Ride introduced it. It was just so it's supposed to be a one-off. It was so intensely popular that they had to make it year round um, for good reason. It's a very good beer. It's a very good porter, but uh, um, the peanut butter kind of character makes it. So I know I've kind of diverged from that purity of the Black Butte classic porter uh, talk, but this is a fun one that um, is just kind of too good to pass up. And I figured as a dessert for the night, might as well go with a desserty kind of desserty kind of beer. So let's open this up. I'm gonna switch back to the main camera. I even have a wild ride glass, if you can see that. So it, it kind of all came together. Get that up here. Now this is a gonna be you know obviously different from every other beer we poured. It's dark brown, almost black. You see down in the corner here, the light, there's, it's not actually opaque, it's, it's clear. If you hold up the light, if you can see through the color, you see some pretty good clarity in here. So you almost get that gold ruby kind of character. This has that brown, tan, light brown, tan head. It's a little creamier, it's a little fizzy. It doesn't, this particular one doesn't necessarily hold, lace up the sides as well, 
partially, I think, probably just because of the, the nut extract. That's okay. But it's got a nice persistence going on there. And that's what we like to see. So Porter is, and they can really range from, I've seen some that are almost pale brown, they call it that they would call a porter to pitch black. And those are kind of the extreme ends. You really just want to see this really nice dark brown character. Um, it's not going to, like I said, it's going to be actually should be quite clear if you could hold it up to a strong enough light to see it. Um, this particular one, I already know. Yeah, it smells like peanuts. It's this peanut butter character. And it, um, normally I'd be skeptical about an extract versus actual nuts, but peanuts are actually incredibly hard to brew with because of the oil content. Um, this smells so, to me, so authentic that I, it's kind of magical. I don't know. I just don't know how they did it so well, but it's always consistently very good, very tasty. And I'm a someone who loves peanut butter anyway, so this is like right up my wheelhouse. But I go, once you kind of get through that peanut character, that peanut butter, there's some nice, really light roast, some hints of chocolate notes in there, some of these, these darker roasted grains. Kind of give it a, oh, a little touch of caramel, not too much, almost maybe a little toffee. It's really, yeah, I mean, this is just kind of what you want out of, of a, a porter. Now, this is a little more desserty. And it tastes, interestingly enough, actually, it tastes like peanuts, but the taste is a lot more subtle than the aroma. And that's actually, that's a good thing because you don't want to have a really cloying, almost sticky kind of character. It's got a nice, reasonably light body. You wouldn't expect that for a dark beer necessarily. That's a myth. Often, oftentimes these darker beers, stouts and porters are lighter bodied than say a big IPA or um, some of these paler colored beers. This has just a really nice, subtle chocolate roastiness and when I'm talking about roasty, it's not really, it's not smoky. Um, it's not like roasted meat or anything like that. It's much more of a, if you imagine, again, come back to that granola analogy. If you imagine like a toasted granola, toasting it just a little bit farther, kind of like, you know, reminiscent of some roast, fresh roasted coffee. Uh, it's that kind of a character. So it's really nicely toasted grains. It's got, I hate to say, <laughs> I hate to say brown malt because that's, um, it's really, it really doesn't mean anything, but a, to me, like as a, uh, as a home brewer, um, a brown malt has kind of got that dry roast, coffee-ish, chocolate kind of character. So I mean, like I said, the peanut character in this, the flavor is there, but it's really mellow. So it really lends to a nice, easy drinking porter, despite the fact that it's, uh, I think it was 6%. And, um, uh, and you have that flavoring. But it's got a nice, just overall nice, smooth character and a smooth body to it. Definitely a nice sipping beer. Um, this is one of those ones, as a nightcap, it's terrific, it's, but it's not too heavy. It's uh, just a night, you know, easy, easy to drink. You could, now I ended up getting a 22 ounce bottle. That was what was available at the store. They also have these in 12 ounce bottles and everything, but I was getting the singles. If you're drinking regular size, Smaller bottles. This is an easy, easily one. It's, eh, maybe a little on the upper end is sessionable at six percent, but you could uh, enjoy a couple of these without feeling too heavy or too, you know, over overly uh, overly full. I think um, if you're looking for, you know, kind of just a dry, dry roast, you know, really nice, nice dry roast nut kind of character in here, and it's, it's you know doesn't leave you too, again, too cloying or too overly desserty. Let's see. I'm going to look at the chat here. I saw a few things roll through. Porter is, is another popular one. I see we had a Crux PCT porter. Ah, that's actually a terrific porter. Um, a little note about that. Crux, Larry Sador, who founded Crux, he's also the brewmaster, uh, worked at Deschutes for seven years before um, leaving his open Crux. So he brewed a lot of black beard porter. Um, he's also been in the brewing industry since uh, 1974 or something like that. He's 
simply one of the most knowledgeable and experienced brewers I've ever met. So when he brewed, when they first brewed that PCT Porter, um, it, it was just rock solid. One of the best new porters I've had in a long time. I see a yay team stout from Sarah. I don't know what she's actually drinking though. Chocolate milk stout from Sun River. Oh, that would be the Coco Cow. That's another good Sun River beer. Um, Coco Cow is another, uh, not a really, a, not a porter, but um, it, you know, as far as stout goes, it's a great, another desserty, um, just uh, drink, tipple, so to speak. It's kind of like drinking chocolate milk. When they actually first introduced it, they brewed it special for uh, the Dairy Mart chain of stores um, over kind of over in the valley across the mountains. Um, and for, of course, they call it chocolate milk stout for Dairy Mart. It, it was one of those ones that blew up in popularity and now they have it year round. And it's just a phenomenal, almost dessert stout from Sun River. Um, we have a polygamy porter from Wasatch Brewery out of Utah. That's another classic beer with a great name because you can't have just one. And what do we got here? Someone mentioned, oh, Ninkasi's ground control. Sarah mentioned that. Ninkasi Brewing, goes back to Samaria, brewed an imperial stout with hazelnuts called ground control. And the original story with that is they actually they used yeast that went to space they sent up some brewing yeast in a, in, in a rocket that made just made like low earth orbit and came back to earth and was still viable to brew with. So they turned it into stout. They use it to brew stout. And they bring that back every year as a seasonal. Oh, and here Sarah finally says, okay, she was drinking the brewery's sticky bun imperial stout. So the brewery, B-R-U-E-R-Y, is located in uh, uh, Southern California and they are known for their giant giant beers. They have an 18% stout called um, Black Tuesday, I think is what it is. 18% barrel aged imperial stout. Basically, it's a liqueur at that point. Let's see, we also have someone drinking, oh, Iron Death, Irish Death, excuse me, from Iron Horse Brewery in Ellensburg. That's actually, I don't know if that's even, a, that's a really nice beer. I'm not sure that even Iron Horse calls out a, a porter or a stout. It's a dark ale, but it, I'll, you know, that class, I'd classify that as a porter because it's just a really light, easy drinking dark ale with a lot of those flavor profiles. They do a great job with the hops too. So I think, let me come back to this real quick. That wraps up my online presentation and kind of gone through my four beers and the styles we talked about. Um, I would love to open it up to any other questions or any last little bit from folks, um, but uh, especially a, a big thank you to everyone who's participating and uh, make sure to visit the library. Um, it's kind of tough with COVID going on and everything. I know, you know, there's some the great online programming and online stuff. Um, I will do a plug uh, for my own book, the Ben Beer, um, the library has it available. So if you're interested in checking out the book, if you haven't already, uh, hit them up. The library's got a bunch of copies actually. Um, and before I totally close the screen down, um, feel free to email me. My blog is on is thebrewsite.com. My email is john, J-O-N, at thebrewsite.com. Um, the beer history book, Ben Beer, is at bendbeerhistory.com. So it's... Um, you know, easy to reach me. Um, just find my website, findthebrewsite.com and hit me on the contact form there. I'm also online on Facebook. If you go to, on Facebook, it's just Brewsite, no the, or no is it the, no, I think, okay, Facebook might be the Brewsite. I don't use Facebook enough. My wife gets on me about that, especially for the social aspect. On Twitter and Instagram, it's Brewsite without the the on it. So I'm going to stop sharing that. I did see one more chat question, a favorite beer city or destination? Uh, there's so many, there's so many, it's hard to, it's hard to pick. Um, obviously living in Bend, we're really kind of spoiled for good beer and as a destination uh, for good beer and breweries, but um, Portland is hard to beat just for the sheer number and variety of breweries they have. But I gotta say, I really like Hood River Hood River, small town with a surprisingly large number of breweries for where they're at. They've got um, 
uh, Full Sail Brewing, Double Mountain Brewery, Freem Family Brewers, uh, the new Ferment Brewing Company, well, relatively new, and um, there's Big Horse Brewing, and then there's others around there. All of those breweries just do fantastic jobs with beers. Um, I'm also a big fan of the, just the coast, and Astoria in particular. Astoria's got, I mentioned earlier, Bowie Beer Company with the Czech Pilsner. They've got a, they do a fantastic job of brewing beers. Fort George in Astoria is phenomenal. Um, and there's others I'm sure I'm forgetting at this point, but but there's so many places, so it's hard it's hard to pick. Sounds like we kind of live in the, the epicenter though in the Northwest. <laughs> we kind of do. I mean, anyone living in Oregon right now has got it pretty good for beer. Even the far flung reaches, so if you've ever been to Baker City, Oregon, they have one of the best the states, in my opinion, one of the state's best breweries in Barley Brown's Brewing there. Hmm. Little town of 10,000 people, uh, east, far eastern Oregon. But um, yeah, Barley Brown's is one of these ones that's been around for 22 years. Started out as a very small brew pub. They've kind of grown since, but they've won a ton of awards and medals and they have brewed some of the best IPAs in the state. So. Hmm. Cool. Looks like we have a couple more questions about a follow-up for what's happened with your book since uh, 2014. Since 2014, there probably should be. I get that question a lot. Part of it is I need to check with the publisher and to see if they would that would be doable. The, the publisher that uh, Arcadia Press that does this series of books, I have not seen any real volume twos from them. So it may be self-publish or some other thing. But yeah, a lot of histories even happened in the local brewing scene in the last six years. Mm. Um, yeah, in fact, a quick, real quick story. My favorite kind of history since the book came out story was um, 2014. I turned in the manuscript in July. The book was published in October. Um, and basically a week before the book was officially out published, um, 10 Barrel, the news came out that 10 Barrel sold to Anheuser-Busch. Um, which is huge, huge, huge news for the for the for the region. But everyone wanted to know if that was in the book, and just no. <laughs> that kind of it was one of those things like uh, the the big some of the biggest news to hit the uh, yeah Ben Burring scene and since the shoots opened or something like that. And yeah, unfortunately, no, it didn't quite make the book. It was missed it by a few months, but. Yeah, they didn't you know, check with you before you <laughs> before you were ready. <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, they didn't. They didn't check with me. If they had checked with me, we could have we could have timed it just right. It, it would have been great. But yeah, unfortunately, no. I think one other question was about um, high ABV bourbons, like barrel proofs. Um, Looks like there's some someone was talking about either bourbon barrel aged beers or actual bourbon. Um, barrel aging beers is huge and super popular these days. Uh, we have a whole festival built around it here in Bend, the Little Woody. I'm sure everyone, probably everyone, a lot of people are familiar with it if you're local. Um, it's gonna be doing something different this year, but it's built on um, barrel aged, wood aged beers, but um, bourbon barrel aging and stouts, big imperial stouts, and sometimes imperial porters. And by imperial, I typically would say 9% alcohol or higher um, is very popular. They Stouts and porters in that in that range of, um, do very well, getting kind of married with bourbon. So it's barrel aging not only combines some of that bourbony character from the barrels, but also gives some of that wood character as well. So you actually get a um, a really nice complex character of oak, uh, bourbon, kind of some of that extended aging. Sometimes you'll get some some sherry-like oxidation character, which is totally appropriate. Um, but also, yeah, super, super popular. In fact, so popular that there was even some barrel shortages because crack brewers were buying all the all the used bourbon barrels up, and others couldn't get them. And it was yeah, it was kind of it was kind of crazy. But I think that's I've a, even whole... have a, a bourbon barrel uh, aged wine too. That was amazing. <laughs> I there may well be actually. I it wouldn't surprise me. I've seen. It wouldn't just be bourbon. I've seen a barrel of all spirit barrels of all kinds used for aging. And actually it's very common these days too to have uh, beers aged in spent wine barrels as well as spirit barrels. So among, I mean, I've seen all kinds of wine barrels. I've seen bourbon and various types of whiskey, rye whiskey and other barrels, uh, rum barrels, tequila barrels, 
the strangest was a, and this was in one of Deschutes' anniversary beers. The two strangest I remember seeing was one was a molasses barrel and one was a salt barrel. So Deschutes Brewery, I can't remember the beer off the top of my head, but they released a just a mega uh, reserve series beer that was, was that one of the porters? one of the stops, but it was aged in a, a, just a, a huge variety of barrels, but including yeah, a salt barrel and a molasses barrel were, were a couple of them. And they basically aged this beer in all these different kinds of barrels and they blend them together to come, kind of come up with this harmonious, um, harmonious drink, this harmonious whole. And it, I remember, I mean, it worked really, really well, but I just never, a salt barrel. I'm like, we all, we all kind of like scratch our heads and we're like, really? <laughs> How do you even find a salt barrel? I mean, who, who does that? But yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Deschutes, Deschutes has a, 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 an incredibly impressive barrel program. The resources and stuff their disposal over the years, they've they've probably got several thousand barrels of all kinds, and they spend a lot of time aging things like the Abyss, which is their annual um, Imperial Barrel Age Imperial Stout, their Black Butte XX Anniversary Series, and and many others. They they age a lot of beer and a lot of varieties of barrels. So. That's a, I mean, that's a whole different presentation, really. You could talk for an hour about different types of barrels and how they affect, how they uh, interact with the beers. We'll have to bring you back to talk about that. But <laughs> this was really fun. Thank you so yeah. much, Ben. And thank you to everyone who attended and was participating in the chat and drinking along. It means a lot. And I um, just want to thank you for joining us virtually. We have a lot of really wonderful programs on deck that you can check out that are all fun, free and virtual. The monthly event guide for the library and the event calendar that are both at DeschutesLibrary.org are a great place to check out upcoming programs or to find programs that you've missed that have been recorded. We have a lot of availability, including this program that will be available on the event calendar under August 12th, but it will begin to be available on August 21st. So uh, please check that out or forward some of your friends who missed out and to go watch this and sip along on demand later on. But yeah, yeah. thanks for joining us, John. Well, um, thanks for inviting me to do this. This is, this is really a lot of fun. Um, uh, I love to talk about beer and actually I get to the, sometimes if I don't have that structure of a slideshow, I can go on and on and on and on, but now this is really good and a lot of fun. And, um, you know, anytime you get to kind of drink and talk is always a good time. So cheers, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us. This yeah. is really cool. Have a good night, everybody. Night. <laughs>